Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, and thank you to Carl as well um, from Winter, everyone at Winter, um, for inviting me on to talk about the perfect landing page. And thank you, everyone, for joining, taking an hour of your time to listen to me ramble about <laughs> the kind of things I've learned being a copywriter. Um, before I get into the, the framework stuff, there's going to be a few things I want to talk about before we get there. Um, and so, first of all, I'm just going to introduce myself briefly so you know who the hell you're listening to, why you should even care, should you even care, are you even going to use any of my um, tips and tricks? So I've been an official copywriter for about five and a half years. Um, and why are you looking at a picture of the Maldives? Because this is the precise moment when I decided to do it. Uh, for the prior 10 years, I've been a fashion designer and before that, a tailor. So I'd been in fashion and I was just sitting on that beach and I just thought, they, I don't want to go back. I am done with the manufacturing mess ups, the thread from Italy, the fabric from this place, the Portuguese, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't deal with the fashion people anymore. And I just thought, when I go back, I want a completely different career. Um, and so I decided that the one skill that I could travel with was my ability to write well. I hadn't done any, I'd not read a copywriting book. I'd not um, formally trained or anything like that. But when you're running your own business, you sort of have to get good at words because you've got to persuade people to do things. So um, probably my greatest achievement back then was the investment pitch I wrote that raised us $115,000 in an in angel investment for a brand that was actually making no money at all. Um, and so I only got that money because of the story I told. And I decided it was all because of the words. So I applied for a job. And a week later, I, I'd, no, two weeks later, I'd started that job. I managed to complete my challenge on that beach was to write my way into a copywriting job. Weirdly, the first assignment they gave me was to write the rejection letter to the other 300 people who'd applied. Um, I kind of found that quite weird and funny. I thought, probably in the right place. Um, and I didn't realize it, actually, but that first role, I was playing on hard mode because it was a really complex financial product for people buying a home. So basically it was a, an alternative to a mortgage. And I had to convince these people to trust this new startup with their entire life savings. Um, that's not the easiest starts for a, for a new copywriter, but um, I, we managed it. And by the time I'd left about three and a half years later, uh, we'd managed to buy 150 homes with UK families. Um, at some point during my time though, we ran an email campaign to a database of a property portal. It's called Zoopla. If you're in the UK, you probably have heard of it. So there are thousands and thousands of people on that list. Um, and I had a 68% open rate, 7% uh, click through rate. And weirdly Zoopla tried to get in touch and wanted me to uh, work for them. Uh, I said no, cause I was really into the company and, and what they were doing that I was already working for. So instead they used my emails as training material for their in-house writers. I'm not trying to show off. I'm just trying to show that you should listen to me. Um, so after that, I did some freelancing for startups like Napo. If you come across them, they're a pet insurance company. And then I did, I did some consulting for a 150-year-old uh, uh, scientific paper publishing behemoth, Spring and Nature. You may have come across the scientific journal Nature and airports and well, everywhere, really. And then I didn't, I can't, you know, Everyone dreams about this freelancing life, this consulting life. It wasn't really for me. I had had a taste of equity in other places and I didn't want to work for you know a client and then go looking for another client. So I really wanted to own a piece of a new business. And so over a year of networking on LinkedIn, I met my two PenFriend co-founders, Inga and Tim. And in December last year, we launched PenFriend, which is an AI tool that writes really, really good first drafts of long form blogs. And it's all based on Tim's 10 years of content strategy expertise. Um, that's an expertise that over the last year has delivered 30.1 million for his clients. And so the examples in the presentation come from that landing page that I wrote to launch PenFriend. And in the first 24 hours, it brought in $40,000 worth of sales. A, th a third of which, I'm really proud of this, 
came from people buying the annual subscription to the most expensive plan. So that's strangers giving nearly $6,000 to a brand new company they may have never heard of. Um, and so I've, I've written that landing page based on my five and a half years of battle-tested copywriting experience in the trenches. I've picked up a lot from putting words to work on real people and asking for money, sometimes lots of money. And so now I'm going to show you how I wrote it. There's actually so much to say and so much that I had to leave out, um, but I'm going to try and do my best to cram as much in as possible. But I think we're going to go over the 30 minute mark, um, but let, let's see what we can get done. I really need the entire day with you all, um, but hopefully you'll find something useful in there that you can use for your own landing pages. Pep's already said this, but there is no perfect landing page. So this is the real title of this workshop. You really just have to get something into the world and see how it reacts. It's, um, it's more of an experiment, one that, one that never ends. You find out how your efforts have done with two things, quant data and qual data. So the way I break those out is quant is what happened and qual is why it happened. And you, you need both for a full picture. But even though there is no perfect landing page, using a framework is so much better than guessing or staring at the blank page, hoping the damn thing will write itself. So why not start with the framework and navigate through iterations? Um, OpenAI's Sam Altman challenges startups to become companies with the fastest iteration feedback loop. So you want to ship something test that, iterate, ship again. At Penfriend, we're trying to do that as quickly as possible. And your North Star is not what your competition are doing. It's not what the CEO wants. It is your, your reader, your user. Ignore everything else. I was thinking last night when I was putting this together that actually a landing page, when you put it through a framework, a really strict one like I'm going to show you, it also creates copy for so many other places. So the same copy you'll use in emails, social posts and ads, webinars, word of mouth. I, I, I don't think there's anything better that crystallizes thought than to write it down. And by writing it down for your reader, you would inadvertently actually reveal it to yourself, I find. And it's the reader who we'll talk about next. Uh, this may surprise some of you, but I've got a lot to say here because I, I agree with some weights. I think we're all just monkeys with money and guns. Um, so oddly to understand what makes good copy, I think we need to put the words to one side and first examine who is reading them and under what conditions, because that way we can reverse engineer what kind of copy kills and what kills copy. The truth is your reader is one of those messy, distracted, illogical things common, commonly referred to as a human. Basically, I think it's a monkey with a veneer of respectability, sometimes wearing clothes. Edgar Allan Poe said, man is the most intelligent of the animals and the most vain. And I think we have just enough intelligence and ego to unfortunately forget that we're monkeys because so much of our lives are dictated by the monkey brain. The monkey brain is the older part of the brain, the part we share with mammals and primates. You, you could even call them the primitive parts. They're the parts that govern primal instincts and primal reactions, including fear, anger, pleasure, survival. In contrast, the parts that deal in higher order thinking, critical thinking and social conduct, all that stuff evolved much, much later. But it's hard to imagine how much later. So let me just tell you a little story. If you condensed evolution into a single day, hominins, our early human ancestors, would only come on into the story at around 11.58 p.m. The first early human ancestors with significant neocortex development, and they're called genus Homo, would only come into the scene at 11.59 and 20 seconds. And those final 40 seconds represent around two to three million years. The preceding 23 hours, 59 minutes and 20 seconds represent billions of years of evolution where primal instincts governed us. 
and we haven't lost those parts of the brain, your reader has those parts of the brain. Dr. Andrew Huburn talks about the prefrontal cortex as a filter for the monkey brain, not a replacement. It's like a checking system, but one we have to consciously engage while the older instinctive parts do all the subconscious emotionally driven decision making. So basically, humans today are still learning to filter the monkey brain. And for writers like you and me, we're up against this billions of years of evolution. And in our comparatively insignificantly minuscule lifespans, nothing's really going to change. So <clears throat> here's how I frame it for myself. We're only ever going to have two options. We change our words to fit human nature, or we change human nature to fit our words. And I'm, all, I'm forever going to look for ways to make my words fit human nature, because there's no way I want to fight those 4 billion years of evolution. But it does seem from a cursory glance at the internet that lots of people are up for the challenge. And as if writing for the monkey brain wasn't difficult enough, you now have to consider the environment in which you want that monkey to stop and pay you attention. I consider reading conditions like war because readers are assaulted on five fronts. Number one, digital. So we've got 349 emails, 39 tabs open, 19 newsletters every day, Netflix, Spotify, the list goes on. Number two, physical, dinner with friends or long commutes or loud offices. Number three, health, sugar crashes, poor sleep, brain fog, low energy. Number four, financial, energy bills, inflation, redundancies, rent, overdue, and then number five, emotional. So anxiety or low self-esteem, failing relationships. Your copy is up against all of this. It's not just other writing, but it's your reader's entire existence. You could actually call us copywriters, copy fighters, because we're in a perpetual battle here and you can't control any of it. Your copy interrupts their life when you press publish because there's no ready to read button for them to press. And so in this really harsh environment, only the most efficient of messages survive. Messages your reader will find engaging and easy to process. Scott Belsky, who founded Behance, uh, who later sold it to Adobe and is now the chief product officer there says, in the first 15 seconds of every new experience, we're all lazy, vain, and selfish. I like to add busy to that list, and it may sound harsh, but actually it's quite logical because I say lazy, but really, I mean, we're efficient. We're machines that look for the shortest path to value. That's why we get addicted to sugar because sugar is so easily converted to energy. And I say we're vain, but actually we're, we're just insecure. We're looking for society's approval, really. We're designed to fit in actually because for millions of years, social exclusion typically led to death. And although I call us all selfish, we're just surviving. We've got this far by looking out for number one. And so we all ask what's in it for me. We rapidly assess new things by how much value we get, how likely that value is, how long it'll take and how much effort we'll have to put in to get it. And then finally busy. And I've already said we're overwhelmed digitally, physically, with our health, our finances, our emotions. But this is why it's so goddamn hard to write for monkeys, because us writers are monkeys too. So we're lazy, so we don't want to write much. We're vain, so we focus on ourselves. We're selfish, so we want our readers' time and money for nothing. And we're busy, so we would rather it just didn't take that long. It's really hard work to switch the focus from us to the reader. But great copywriters know it's their duty to fight human nature so their readers can indulge it. Hopefully now the scene is set and you understand the magnitude of the task here, but it can be done. So let's jump into the framework. So this is Winter's B2B messaging layers. Really what you're doing here is completing a checklist of reader questions in a particular order. 
And so you start with the question, what even is this? Like quickly tell me what it is. And Pep at Winter has wrapped this up in the word clarity. Next follows relevance. So, okay, now I get what it is, but you know, is it for me? Is it aligned with my priorities and pains? Then value, like, like, is it really what I want? How bad do I want that? What's in it for me? And then differentiation. Why you and not your competitor? And then finally, this is the landing page. And we want these people to give us their cold hard cash. So at some point, we're just gonna make the strong ask and see if they convert. So this is the pen friend landing page. Don't worry, you shouldn't need to read it. The whole point of this slide is just to show you where those different sections fit. So clarity at the top, which doubles as the above the fold section, which we'll go into in a second. Just below that, we've got relevance. Value is the longer section there. And then just under that, you've got differentiation. There's a whole load more things on, the, on this <clears throat> um, landing page that I'll go through and show you. So let's start with clarity. So really the reader question is, what is it? People want to quickly know what they're dealing with. They're assessing basically whether or not to waste time on you. Um, and if you're unclear in this first 15 seconds, you're already giving them the answer. They will not waste any time trying to decode your messages. They don't care about you. They're not gonna work out what the tangible benefit that is that sits behind the vague branding phrase that you may have confronted them with. Um, you know, you kind of see these things all over the place, but you know, life reimagined. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know what it means. Um, it means nothing actually, because it could mean everything. So many brands could use that, that phrase. So I want to delve a little deeper into how I'm being clear at the top. Um, and there's a whole lot of other things actually here. It's not just about clarity, but really the main thing is like, what the hell am I dealing with? Why should I bother? What we have to do at the top here is earn either the click, which is a little bit aggressive. Like you just landed on the page. You want me to do something straight away? Probably not. Really what we're trying to do is earn the scroll. So the top above the fold, whatever that means these days, device sizes are all different. In that first section, you want to earn the scroll so that when they scroll, you can earn the sale. So again, pen friend landing page, the title here, what I'm doing here is making a bold claim. I have to get their attention. I have not got long. So the title's job is to catch people's attention and make them read the next line. Like, is that good enough to make you read the subtitle? So making a bold claim works really well. Um, so in this case, it's generate high quality SEO articles without prompting. The subtitle then is to make that bold claim believable. We need to substantiate it. We need to give evidence. We need to show results. We need to earn that click or that scroll. So the subtitle here says, PenFriend generates articles based on a proven content strategy that's delivered 30.1 million in revenue. We've spent 500 hours refining prompts and guide you through article creation step-by-step. Another thing I like to do with the title is encourage the action by starting it in the imperative form. I could have just said high quality SEO articles without prompting, but I want to already get into people's minds the idea of taking action. So I'm like, generate them, generate them. Now here we've got the outcome. So this is what people are gonna get. This really couldn't be clear. It's not fuzzy at all. It's high quality SEO articles. You may think like, oh, that's the feature, not the benefit. But here I'm trying to be brutally clear. I am I sometimes think people go too far down this benefits, not features uh, path. And the benefit becomes very fuzzy. Um, and then you end up at life reimagined, <laughs> like your blog reimagined. No, that, 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 people don't know what's going on, especially with a new company. Let me just be brutally clear and hope that in your mind, I don't think this is flawed, that when you see high quality SEO articles without prompting, that triggers something for you. You know what that means to you. Um, and then 
a nice little trick that I picked up from Neil O'Grady at Demand Curve, who I really rate. Join the newsletter, follow him on LinkedIn. Um, he likes to add the main objection at the end of the title because bold claims always come with a, yeah, but you know, if it's going to be bold, you've got, you got to put something out there that's quite bold. So people are going to be skeptical. Remember we're talking, we're, you know, writing for these scared risk averse monkeys. So cover that thing quickly, get ahead of them. And you'll also make them feel heard. If you get it right, they'll be like, that was in my head. How did you know that? Um, you need to show results as well. So in choosing an image to go above the fold, don't just pick a random one. Uh, with software, it's usually a good idea to show people what they're going to see on the other side of the click, on the other side of giving you money. Like, what does it look like? That's really clarity too. Um, you're feeding them the, the entire picture. So we couldn't do that, obviously, because part of our results here are the time it takes and the money it costs. So I just clearly wrote it <laughs> on top. You can see what you get as part of the software, but to make it brutally clear, it's just, this took nine minutes to write and only cost twelve ninety nine. And to someone in a content team who you know would normally take uh, hours and hours, weeks really, back and forth between people to write the blog, and for it to end up costing between four hundred and twelve hundred dollars, that's probably quite compelling. And then you want to make your action obvious. Don't have a weirdly hidden button. Don't make it a weird color. Make it bold. Like this is your first ask, so ask boldly. Um, we want to make the place to take action clear and obvious and this button stands out. So talking of buttons, CTAs, um, I want to talk a little bit about how to convert because I don't really consider the CTA to be just the button. We talk about it like that and I accidentally do too, but let me show you. So the purpose is actually in the CTA itself. You just rearrange the letters and you get what you want to happen act. We want to create action. And so how do you do that? Well, you need to give them an irresistible outcome with no risk. So let's just dive into that a little bit. So what does irresistible actually mean? You've kind of got four options here. Low value, as in you're giving them low value, high effort, they have to put high effort in. That's not irresistible. You give them low value, but they put low effort in, that's really not irresistible either. High value, great, but they have to put a lot of work in to get it. That's equally not as irresistible. And so your only option is you give them high value, but they don't have to do much. High value and low effort. And so this is how I think I've done it here. So high value is the, the outcome, the thing they want. The high quality SEO articles without prompting. It's based on a proven content strategy that's delivered you know, millions in revenue already. Um, and we guide them through the whole uh, article creation process step by step. That's all very high value. High value again is nine minutes, 12.99 to get this. And all we require is you just to sign up and you get your first article free. And actually last week we made it three articles for free. So that's even more value for the same amount of effort, but you can see what I'm trying to get at here. So next outcome, what is an outcome? Well, it's, you know, a life transformed, it's results secured, it's convenience or money made, time saved. And so again, outcome is right there. You can do all the other things you need to do, marketing person, the blog being one of your 1000 tasks, and we're gonna help you. We're gonna help you use AI properly it's going to take you nine minutes. It's going to cost you twelve ninety nine, and you can get on and get a really, really good first draft and actually do something with it. And this is probably the biggest one. So I, I really think people are super, super scared of like doing things. So we need to de-risk everything. We need to make it safe, reversible. We need to have nothing at stake. And so how have I made it safe above the fold? Well, it's a proven content strategy that's already delivered money for tons of clients. We've made it safe by putting so much time into getting these prompts right. It's probably more like 750 hours now. Um, it's safe because you can see what's on the other side of the click. I've shown you 
the image. It's safe because other people are already using it at the very bottom. Island, contrast, e-webinar, Maven. And it's really easily reversible because you can unsubscribe anytime. Your first article is free. You don't need to add a credit card right now. It's all good. Just try it. So next section. I know we're at sort of time, but I am nowhere near done. At any time, Pep, you can just come and cut me off. We can do Q&A, but I've got so much more to say. So just, I'll just carry on until you cut me off. So relevance, is it for me basically? Um, so who are these people that I'm trying to attract at Penfriend? Well, weirdly or not, <laughs> I was one of them. In my first copywriting job, I was in the product team and the marketing team and the ops team actually. I was one of those like stretched across, I was the only writer basically, so stretched across everyone. But one of my roles in one of my departments was to do the blog. <clears throat> And if anyone is charged with doing the blog, you know what a monster that is already. That's someone's entire job, <laughs> really. Um, my co-founder, Inga, was one of them. When she launched her company, Top Apps, she was trying to build it using a content strategy with Tim. Uh, she was a client of Tim's at the beginning. She spent over $100,000 getting writers to write things, edit them. It was a... She, she did a good job, but my God, did it cost her a lot of money. And then we've got Tim's clients. Um, and I spoke to Tim for ages because we're moving really fast. I didn't want to spend hours and hours talking to the actual people. I was just looking for quick proxies to them. So I was a quick proxy to it. I, would, I had Inga and I had Tim's clients through Tim. That was all I needed at this point. We're trying to move fast here. So the interesting thing about Tim's clients were that they were all different. Um, there was not an obvious universal identifier. I couldn't like say, hey, you're this kind of person. You have this job role. So I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, and instead, I used problems as the way to make us relevant. So I think this is interesting too. At the top here, I'm just blatantly, clearly saying what this is for. This section is like, who is Penfriend for? Don't, don't hide these things. Just say them. Just be blunt. So... The line underneath is, is where I maybe get into this. Whether you're a content team of 10 or a solo content producer, Penfriend is for you if, and then I've got my, my six kind of problems or pains. Um, and I'm saying to my readers, if you resonate, it's relevant. Um, problems and pains are great. So problems, seeing their problems fed back to them, readers will feel heard and they'll believe the solution is for them. Uh, not believe in like you're tricking them, but if they see it and they read it and they resonate, you get it. Um, and pain has been proven to be a greater motivator than gain. So we're more motivated by not losing $100 than gaining $100. Next section, value. This section, really, the reader's saying, what do I get out of it? And so the titles here, get high quality articles in minutes, not weeks. Your dedicated internal writer that never sleeps. Less dependency on expensive freelancers. Get reliable, consistent, high quality AI output. No prompting necessary. Turn your blog into a traffic generating engine. That's what you get. I'm like, you get this, you get this, you get this. I'm over win for you. Then the paragraphs below explain more and tie pen friend features into that outcome. And the bold claim made back at the top of the page. And that's something I picked up from Harry Dry at Marketing Examples. It's like, you get X outcome because we have Y feature. Don't be scared of features because losing them completely can make things a little vague. You just need both, that's all. Um, <clears throat> really, essentially what you're trying to do is, the analogy that sticks in my head is, you want to sell the feeling of being on holiday. You don't want to sell the plane ticket, but it is that plane ticket that gets you the feeling of being on holiday. So that's the one that's always stuck in my head. Now, differentiation. This one is why you are not your competitor. We are not the first AI content writing tool. And I think differentiation is all about specificity and contrast. And those are two of the things, two out of three things that I think make up clarity. 
sidetrack. It's for me, it's clarity equals specificity plus contrast plus familiar words. But here again, we're trying to be clear and clearly define how we're different from other people. So again, the sort of title here for this section is why choose brand friend. I don't think there's anything wrong in just completely calling out. Now we're going to say this bit. So it, how is this based on 10 years of Tim's results? Really? It's his content strategy in a software tool. So, um, 30.1 million revenue for clients, 2,500 articles in the last three years, and then 450 K organic traffic in six months for a new site. The odd thing we found about traffic is that although it's not really the thing people want, they want the money that comes off the back of the traffic. They want the conversion. They think they want traffic. And so throughout this entire landing page, I'll be talking about cash, but I'll also be talking about traffic because that's, what's going to resonate for the people that we've spoken to. Um, the other thing that makes us different is that we've built all the prompts and put them in the back end. And it's not just one prompt. We're not um, an AI uh, chat GPT wrapper. We have, over 20 specific prompts per article and we're going to increase them because there's so much more we can do by having a, a chain of prompts basically. Um, and if you go to you know, copy AI or uh, Jasper or any of those places, you really have to sort of do a bit of the prompting and we want to take that all away. Um, so that that's part of our differentiation as well. Um, and then we've got people on our team who are going to keep up with SEO and AI. It's not like we're hiring consultants, like they're in the team. We will refine Penfriend to stay ahead of all these changes in content strategy, SEO best practice, AI prompting, and promise, promise you it's gonna change. So we'll, we'll keep up with that. Now, those are the sort of the four first stages. Um, after every single one, I've put somewhere to consider and convert. And what I'm doing here is basically saying, have I told you enough yet? Are you ready? So. I've done the clarity, but it's this, you get this. Don't worry about it. Chill out. We're not going to hurt you. No credit cards. Go and play. Is that enough? There's a button there. And then maybe not. Okay. So scroll. So, all right, this is for you. If you have these problems and these pains, is that enough? Click the button. You know, you're going to get all of these things, the value, blah, 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 blah. It all ties back to the thing we think you want. Is that enough? All the way down. So it breaks up every single section. Every time I'm asking someone to consider, I'm trying to de-risk it for them. You'll notice in a second that every time there's a, a button, a CTA button, there's also some social proof. And that's what I've taken from Eddie Schleiner's landing page course, Transformational Landing Pages. Um, it, I, Eddie's course is great. It ended up being a, more in my mind, I would put it into like a sales page bucket in the way that he wrote it. But there's so many good things in there. And this is the one thing that stood out. Eddie truly believes in social proof. And I do too. This is Eddie's social proof for his free newsletter. You, I could not fit it in. On the right hand side there, the videos, they just keep scrolling. And it's like famous person off LinkedIn, famous person off Twitter, like idol role model in our industry. It's kind of crazy. He's been at it for a long time. He's very, very good. But don't be shy at helping people get over the hurdle of like, I don't want to be first. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a denigration on human on humans, but I really think we're more like sheep than guinea pigs. We don't really like to go first. And it's why we have to try so hard to be uncomfortable in life. We really kind of naturally want to be comfortable. So make it easy for people to show that the path has already trodden, done it before. We've already made money. Someone's already tried it. You're just coming along too. <laughs> and so uh, we have loads of uh, social proof on the site. We'll put more on when we have it. Um, we have Jess at the top of the page because she is probably one of the most well-known. Um, she's on LinkedIn. Um, and so you can see that the, we've picked people also that say things that resonate with the thing that we think people want. So a lot of time saving, um, human language that AI has not been able to do yet. Um, and you know, done in 10 minutes. So long form, really short and done by done so that it's a, uh, you know, human at the end, not robotic. Uh, Philippa, also well-known on LinkedIn. Uh, hers was great. We had her really high up on the page because she's got the contrast of all the um, the competition that probably people have tried, Jasper, CopyAI, ChatGPT, Writer. 
and she thinks PenFriend is 10x better. Now, 10x is just one of those phrases. Whether it's actually 10x is another thing, <laughs> but um, you know, it's high quality in the less in the less time. We're trying to get that high quality, high quantity thing, which is almost impossible with blogs. We think we've cracked it. Uh, Sam Brown, another sort of well-known LinkedIn uh, personality, um, talking about the process going from hours to minutes. It's the quantity quality thing again and the ability for a small team to, to to sort of punch above its weight, as he says. I was thinking of words and I just looked at his words like, God damn, Sam, thank you very much. Um, Megan, Senior Content Marketing Manager at Maven, takes uh, an hour process to minutes, already ranking Google for keywords and driving an impact, which is really interesting because I don't know how many of you deal with this, but like, what is the blog doing for the company? Well. Let me give, like, give me some time, give me some money and I'll show you. But she's obviously um, being able to show that already. Um, and so, yeah, the message there is get social proof and whack it on your page. Don't be shy. So those are the kind of the B2B messaging layers that I took from Pat and Winter. Um, but there were just other things that needed to be on this page. So as much as a framework is useful to start, don't leave things out that you think your gut is telling you that needs to be there. To really get across what PenFriend does, I had to have quite an extensive how it works. And then, you know, the novice would say, oh, this page is too long. I think, what do you mean long enough for what? I'm saying everything I need to say and I'm trying to write it in as few words as possible. So it is as long as it is. Um, so the how it works, it just needs to be written. It actually still covers a lot of the things we've talked about. It's not like it's a different um, part of what we're trying to do. We're still ticking off those things. So we still get clarity. So, you know, one of the steps is PenFriend uses real-time insights based on today's search engine results to see which articles already rank for the keywords you need to rank for. Like, that's very clear on what it is, what it's doing. Uh, and I'm not sure if many other AI writing tools do that. We're actually going to go and check, see what's ranking. Then the value, like what do you get out of this at the end? Well, you want to outrank your competition. So by studying those articles that are ranking, we identify the common patterns and the untapped opportunities and the blog that we write for you matches the patterns and then fills in the gaps so that you can value outrank the competition. Differentiation appears here too. So in step seven, we dedicate full AI power to every article section. So where someone in ChatGPT would be using uh, one prompt to write an entire blog, that doesn't work. We use an entire prompt to write every single section, every H2, every H3. That makes us different. And then pricing, just very, very quickly on this bit. It needs to be there, right? Let's not hide the pricing. Let's not make them book a sales call with the team who's just going to, no, 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 I, no one's going to do that. So very clear, typical, you know, the pattern, the SaaS pattern. Again, we're trying to be clear though, right? So it's the articles you get a month, um, the cost is going to uh, cost you, the price is going to cost you per article. Um, something that we didn't have in immediately, but then put in because we did some more research that people wanted to know if they could use all their articles, if they got the annual plan. So yes, that's now much clearer. Um, and then some kind of value there. So based on proven content strategy, articles written to outrank, no prompting necessary, like de-risking, you don't have to do anything. There's not much effort here. Um, and then, you know, the final billing. So it's not like these sections aren't doing the same kind of things. Now, non-negotiables, you have to, I think, provide answers to these questions. Um, these are primal objections that come from Zig Ziglar, who was a salesman, motivational speaker, author, and mentor to Seth Godin, who I'm sure many of you know. Zig spoke of five sales objections that needed to be covered to make a sale. So it's no need, no desire, no trust, no money, no hurry. So let's go through them and see how I tried to cover them. So no need. Really what you have to do here is position your product or service as a painkiller as opposed to a vitamin. So a painkiller is something you need to have. When you're in pain, you will pay any amount of money to take it away. A vitamin, ah, vitamin D, nice. I could walk past it in an aisle, easy. I don't need it, but if my leg's falling off, I probably need to go to the hospital. So here I've gone out with, you can't get the quality you need with AI. So you need us instead. It's so low quality, 
you'd be better off getting articles written by your 14th best outsourced writer. So how do you attack no desire? Well, you kind of have to do it by pulling them towards it. So although pain pushes people to act, desire pulls them to, and you need both. So we discovered that people wanted quality and quantity. They couldn't find it. And so we've done work to suggest that's what we can give you. Finally, you can have quality and quantity, quantity all for a fraction of what you currently pay. No trust. How, how do we build trust immediately? Well, we have to say things like, you know, based on a proven content strategy that's delivered this amount of money before. And it's not like I'm manipulating or tricking. This is just true. True, but easy to forget. So build these things into your, into your landing page. Build trust by saying what's already happened. No money. This is an interesting one because people often think, you've got no money, well, you'll never be able to afford it. Or I'll just reduce my price until a point where you go, okay. But actually, I think no money often just means it's not a priority because we will buy weird things uh, and then say, we, you know, we've got no money for something else. But uh, yeah, I can go on holiday, that's a priority. Um, but I've got no money for rent. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is um, just show them that it is a priority because if they don't act, something's going to happen. You know, you can't pay less and fill the blog with low quality content. You have to act, you have to do something about it. And you know you need lots of high quality articles and quickly as well. You need to out content your competition before they build an impenetrable content moat. So make it a priority by showing them the effects of not acting. And then no honey, no hurry, no honey, that would be an interesting one, but no hurry. Um, I've just actually gone into it there. All diets start tomorrow, unless you show the need for action today. So you're, you're trying to show them what happens if they don't buy from you. Um, we're nearly getting there, Pep. I know we've got 15 minutes, but um, I'm just going to carry on. Um, I want to talk about the value equation. This comes from Alex Hormozzi. So Alex is an entrepreneur, author. If you don't know him, I don't know how. He is every single where. Um, in his book, $100 Million Offers, he really eloquently and logically puts a framework around the very fuzzy word value. So how did he define it? Well, it's a dream outcome first. And forget the formulaic thing, it's a little bit over the top, but dream outcome times perceived likelihood of achievement divided by time delay and uh, times effort and sacrifice. That equals value. I'll break it down a little bit more. So here's the dream outcome. High quality articles in minutes, not weeks. Finally, you can have quality and quantity all for a fraction of what you currently pay. These are just things that I'm trying to build into my landing page wherever I can. Like, have I shown the value yet? Have I shown the dream outcome? Have I shown how likely that's going to be? How have I shown that you can get it really quickly? And how can I show that you don't have to put much work in to get it? We'll do the work for you. That's our job. I'm trying to fit that in wherever I can, not just in the value section, wherever it, it appears. So perceived likelihood of achievement. Well, that's based on results, right? We've we haven't done this before. Um, we had, you know, Tim was using ChatGPT and doing it all very manually at first, but everything that PenFriend is, is based on his strategy. So there's probably a likelihood that this is going to work. Um, and it is working, which is great. Um, but you had to sort of prove that to people before they'll give you a shot. Uh, time delay. We, we loved getting Megan's um, testimonial here because they're already ranking. This must have been, honestly, a couple of weeks. It was kind of crazy. So we, you know, we put that on the landing page for sure. And then the effort and sacrifice, here's an example. You don't have to prompt, like how, figuring out how to make the robot do the thing, really tricky. We've done it all for you. It's just in the back. We'll take you through step by step, one choice at a time. Do you like the title? Yes, no, carry on. Do you like the outline? Yes, no, carry on. And then I'm going to finish with uh, research and inspired by the way that Winter talks about research with a small r. I really think it's the most important thing and you really have to be quick with this. Um, I think Pep's been talking about this the last couple of weeks. Don't do monster year long things. Iterate quickly as Sam Altman suggests, become the company with the fastest iteration loop. I'm just gonna show you some of the things that I put out there. I love surveys for, for this kind of stuff. Yes, we do call, we will do call stuff as well. We'll get a higher user researcher. We'll get them talking to people. We'll be all be in the, in the sessions, note taking, and we'll get 10 to 15 and we'll go and digest. That can take a long time. So in the meantime, surveys are phenomenal. My favorite question for a survey comes from the book Ask. It's not really well known, I don't think, 
I read it a long time ago, but it's this one here. It's what's the number one problem, blah, blah, blah. And what it does is it focuses on a problem so that then you know what the problem is and if your solution solves it. But also it's the number one thing that's really important because people, if you just write vague questions, you'll get vague answers. So now you're really asking a very direct, specific question. What's the number one thing? What's the number one problem you experience when writing articles? And you can see I've asked, please be as descriptive as you can. Like I want, if, you, if you've got an energy, please give me the words because I want everything from you. And then you see the answers here. I get caught up in spending way too much time in researching mode. Um, many times I draft articles which never see the light of day. Time, sitting down and writing the entire article. Time again, time and SEO. I've been slacking creating blog posts. It, it, was, it went on and on and on. It's exactly what I felt when I was working in the marketing team. Um, another question. So that's me getting there like unfiltered stuff. So this question came next. They, these were my guesses and I wanted to separate them. They couldn't see them on the same page. So you tell me from your heart what your, what your pain is. Now, I've got some guesses for you. Which ones do you resonate with? Um, and so I just put some of them on there. The kind of things I thought might be on the landing page. And then you get some results and people fill in surveys. I'm always surprised. Um, it's great. And you can see the top one there. I have no time to write them myself. It's not like people can't write them. They definitely can. They are just way too stretched. It's one of a thousand things they need to do. So time. The really interesting thing I found here was the no budget for an internal writer. I thought that might be a thing, you know? I thought that the mental process would be, I can't do them myself. If I could hire an internal person to do blogs, I would. And then I would go to freelancers after that. But that second option is so not an option that it isn't even in our brains. And so people go from, if I can't write them, I have to get a freelancer to write them. There's just no budget to pay someone on the team full time. So I'm going to be changing that on the landing page. You can see how quick this data came back as well. Um, so this was really interesting. Have you tried using AI tools to help you write articles? How much like, explaining do I need to uh, about AI? How many people have used these tools? And it's a resounding yes, 89% um, have used tools before. Now it's not a huge amount of people. I really wanna draw attention to these 29 responses. You don't need hundreds and hundreds and hundreds to make a first guess. A first good assumption. You're not guessing, you're making logical assumptions, really. And then I thought this was super interesting. Um, which AI tools have you tried? List out the obvious ones and I let them fill the other ones in. They've tried all of these. And then which, are, which tools do you use today? Very, very few. It's just ChatGPT. It looks like the people trying to solve this problem have not solved it. And people have just gone back to ChatGPT and they were trying to struggle through on their own with their own prompting stuff. I can work that in, right? I can work that into the copy on the landing page. I can talk about that. I can say that they've tried them, they've rubbish, they've failed, they've just let you down. AI is not living up to the hype, you know, that kind of thing. And here again, it's my favorite question. What's the number one? So what's the number one thing we could do to improve article quality? And very briefly, we've got tons of stuff about, please let us do a bit of editing on the outline so that I don't have to do as much editing at the end. And so we have our first product iteration and it's in the works now. These are the last slides, I promise. And I can stay on, by the way, to do Q&A if anyone else can. Um, so here's how these things translated directly to the landing page. So in the problem section, you don't have time to make the blog a traffic generating engine, which remember is the thing that they think they want. They want traffic. Increasing blog traffic with authoritative articles is only one of the 1,000 things you need to do. Here's another one. Um, so you don't have time to become an expert prompt engineer. It's like, how dare we? marketing person doing a thousand billion things you now need to become an expert prompt engineer to be more productive and get to work so not knowing how to prompt means your ai results don't save you time and don't make you more productive and that comes directly from the the surveys and then the last one which ai tools do you use to help you write articles today yeah none of them basically you can't get the quality you need with ai it's so low quality you'd be better off getting articles written by a 14th best outsource writer so I think I'm at the end and I honestly could have gone on for another um, 8.53 hours specificity equals truth. Um, but because of, I've, I've sort of blown up a little bit on landing pages. I did a cheat sheet uh, before Christmas and it got 7,500 comments on LinkedIn. So I've decided that people 
may need a little bit of help. So I'm putting together a, a landing page video course and you can go and check out the pre-sale at copywriting.io. But with six minutes left, um, Pep, <laughs> I'm done with my slides. Boom, boom, awesome. Thank you very much. And let's see um, which questions we have time to tackle. All right, so I'm going to start with the most upvoted one. First one is about information hierarchy. How do we decide the hierarchy of content uh, in a landing page? Will it be same for each landing page? I think to start with, yeah, it should be the same. Why, why mess around? To start with the, the framework that has data uh, to back it up, you know. Pep, you've done so much work on this stuff. Um, when I saw those B2B messaging layers, I looked back at old landing pages I'd done, and they were mainly there, but there were some things missing. Um, I definitely wasn't as hot on differentiation a few years ago. Um, it was kind of there, but just not called out, not brutally called out. So I would never start with anything other than the the amalgamation of your formula plus other people's formulas and, and just what I've seen work, basically. So, mm -hmm. But there's a test, right? Yeah, there's test. Right. Just the differentiation layer depends on how mature is the, the category you're in, how many competitors you have, like it might, if you're doing something completely novel, you might have no direct competition other than status quo. Uh, all right, next question. Matt is asking, how do you best suggest showing value when there is not a price associated? I guess it's a free offer on a landing page or something. Oh, well, value is based on really Alex Hormozzi's formula. Like what's the dream outcome? that there's still going to be, even if it's free, there's value, right? You saw Eddie Schleiner's, uh, you know, testimonials on his on his free newsletter. Like that doesn't cost anything, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, but what's the dream outcome? It's like, learn how to write like Eddie, become a copywriter, uh, make your copy better in your, in your startup. Um, it's still the same stuff. It's still the dream outcome. Plus like, how believable is it? How quickly will I get the results? And how much effort do I need to put in? If you can do that, You've kind of figured out value, I think. All right, uh, next question. Uh, this, I have a very strong opinion here myself. Uh, CTA buttons. Uh, should you repeat exactly the same CTA or ask for various actions? Uh, personally, I would stick with the same. Uh, specifically on PenFriend, it is uh, just you know our first landing page, so it's our first test. I don't really want to confuse people with different options. And this is a landing page, not a home page, which may differ slightly. You may have different places if people jump off to. But really, I just want one thing and I want to see if you do it. And if I start messing around with different messaging across all the buttons, I don't know what put you off. I don't know what you decided to do there. It's going to take a way longer to figure out why the qual data is going to take so much longer to grab. So I would say stick with the same thing. Exactly. And use the exact same language because otherwise if, if it let goes to the same place but once it says sign up then it says learn more and i was like get it and like you start wondering <laughs> are these different things you see it all the time it's it's the worst i, I did um, it i did it the other day i put like get your first three articles but the sticky one in the nav bar was like try i was like no but we, we fixed it yeah how would you know that they are it's the same thing uh, all right katya is uh saying how to express the no risk idea if a product is completely new and you have no customers who you could use for reviews? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think no risk comes from like making it safe and reversible and safety can come from things like this has worked before. So, you know, we didn't have any reviews for PenFriend, but we had this strategy that we were basing it on that had worked for clients. You sort of need to take abstraction levels back and sometimes your social proof could be in the form of social proof the problem exists. So yeah, no one's tried it maybe, but maybe if you had someone credible talking about the problem, that could help. Um, also, what we did was we had beta testers. Um, and so we had sort of 15 people who used it for two weeks and then gave us their honest feedback. So it's really easy to get. You don't really have to spend that much time in market without some sort of proof. Totally. Get get free beta users um, in exchange yeah. for review. They have to commit upfront writing something, and then uh, when you do your 
hard launch, you have something. Also, of course, no risk, risk reversal as a concept. You there are other ways than testimonials, you know, that you can make all kinds of guarantees, money back guarantee, or I'll pay you double back if it doesn't work, you know. Yeah, I think that's yeah, yeah. And doable. Uh, okay, next question. For how it works section, how did you decide to get this content order? The content order comes directly from the process of pen friend building an article. So it's very logical. Like you type your, your keywords in. We'll go and do this with your keywords. Then this bit happens. It's really simple for someone to, to follow that. Mm -hmm. No, no more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, Andy is asking, uh, what made you decide to use your homepage as your sole landing page? Um, have you thought about uh, splitting it into multiple pages? Partly to not overcomplicate a launch. We wanted to move fast. And so we did we really need a homepage and a landing page? Probably not. They're going to be the same thing right now. As we grow and we become more complex, really, with maybe what we offer, which I do not want to do, uh, we may split it out. And there are certain things on that landing page that are homepagey. So on a true, true landing page, you probably wouldn't have a nav bar at the top because you don't want them to go and click anything else except for the CTA. But it's a hybrid. But really, I don't think they're that different until you get into a large, humongous company like Springer Nature, where your homepage is really like the front door. And it's like, which room do you want to go to next? That's when uh, content hierarchy becomes very, very important. Um, so that's the reason, really. Ease, simplicity. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, let's take one last one. Um, let's see which one's an interesting one. Um, I know this is all about copy, but how does design and photography influence the perfect landing page? Oh, I love this question. Yeah, I think the best copywriters are part designer and the best designers are part copywriter. Um, I had a really good experience at Way Home, my first startup. It was me, the UX designer in a room bringing this thing to life together. And when I don't have that other person, um, I have a design-ish background. So I like working in Figma. I have to bring it together at the same time. What you must never do uh, for, for contrast is write in isolation in a Google Doc, design in isolation in a framework, and then try and plunk them together. It just never works. Yeah, I love the saying that if a designer designs the design of the landing page before the copy is done, then this person is not a designer, but a decorator. You're designing mm, that. design. The only point of design is to help communicate the message. Like Agreed. the design is, is not the point. The, the message is the point, right? I completely agree. Yeah. And also you're sort of designing your copy in your formatting. So, you know, sentences, white space bullet points it is designed in that sense that you know mm -hmm. this is the most efficient way to transmit the message from my brain to your brain no clutter no nothing else without it being robotic and boring of course you need soul sass soul that exists yeah well uh we're out of time john thank you so much for sharing your um, expertise here with us uh, much appreciated and uh, all these questions that uh, uh, were unanswered, uh, please connect with John on LinkedIn. He's on LinkedIn. Shoot your uh, message. Maybe, maybe he'll, he'll have time. I don't know. I will. Uh, John, I really think it. <laughs> sorry, everyone, but yeah, reach out to me on LinkedIn or John at copywriting.io, and I'll have a go at uh, answering your questions. All right. Awesome. Well, peace out. I'll see you uh, on the internet, dude. Thanks, Pep. Have a good day. Bye. And by everybody else, uh, if you have your perfect landing page crafted, you still don't know what your actual target customers think of it. So always do message testing. It's the only way to know how it actually lands on the target customers, what they think, what do they find compelling, what do they find confusing, what's interesting, what's boring, iteration. Um, because any best practice is only a starting point. It's, it's where we start, not where we end up. All right, peace out, guys. Uh, New winter workshops coming up uh, soon. Join our newsletter. I guess you're already enrolled, maybe. Um, see you on LinkedIn. Peace.